left off yesterday in a discussion of Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42 is probably the central verse in all of ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. Luke gives us a little snapshot of the early church, what the early church did in Acts 2.42. Now, here's the thing. Um, when we interpret the Bible, just because we find something in the Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that whatever we find happening in the Bible is supposed to happen in our lives. There's, the, there's a difference between a command. If Scripture commands us to do something, a command or a pattern if we simply see Christians doing something. A, a pattern, for instance, when we see the early church doing this or that, does not have the same force as a command. For instance, there's a very strong movement called the house church movement. There's a very strong house church movement in China. But there's also a house church movement in Britain, and there's also a house church movement in North America. And someone who is involved in the house church movement may say, well, we shouldn't meet in big churches, we should meet in houses because the early church met in houses. Is that a good argument? No, it's not a good argument. <laughs> It's not a good argument for lots of reasons. Um, first of all, Christians also met in the synagogue. But secondly, during much of the New Testament period, the church was either illegal under the Romans or persecuted among the Jews. They couldn't have a big church building. And the Christians were poor a very high percentage of early Christians were slaves. They couldn't afford to have a building. And there weren't many of them, so they didn't need a big building. They met in houses out of necessity. They met in houses because that's the only option they had. So to look at a pattern in the early church and say, well, the early church met in houses, so we should only meet in houses, that's bogus. That's not good thinking. That's not good theology. But there may be other patterns in the book of Acts which are helpful and which we may want to imitate. But, but the reality is the fact that we see a pattern is not as forceful, is not as authoritative as when we have a command, when we're told to do something. Now, the reality is the four things which are happening in Acts 2.42 are all things which are commanded, are all things which we, ought, which we ought to be doing. So this picture of the life of the uh, early church in Jerusalem is something which all churches today should look at and, and try to imitate. It says in verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. We talked about that. And to fellowship. We talked about fellowship yesterday. That was the last topic we talked about when we broke up yesterday. There are two other things. And to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread, what is this? Well, it's the Lord's Supper. Let me just say that in the history of the church, there's been much bad preaching. I'm sure there's been bad preaching in my own churches on the Sundays when I was preaching. But sometimes there's been bad preaching because there's been bad doctrine, unbiblical doctrine. This is one reason why the Lord's Supper is so important. Because for 20 centuries, even in churches 
led by a pastor or a preacher who either didn't know the truth or didn't believe the truth or was not good at communicating the truth. If you have the Lord's Supper, if someone stands up and reads the story of Jesus' last evening with his disciples in the upper room, talks about the death of Christ, and then the drama of Christ's death is reenacted, we live off his, his body, we live off his blood, his death gives us life. If a person hears that, if a person sees that, if a person believes that, that person can be saved, even if the preaching is bad. So this is something that, that Christ has given to the church to make sure that however bad anything else is, if we are remembering his death in the way that he said, if we're looking back at his death, and we're looking forward to His second coming, we will know enough to be saved. We will know enough to be in a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Obviously, there's more to it than that. And um, different Christians and different Christian groups debate on the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Um, Roman Catholic churches, and Orthodox churches believe that the bread is actually materially turned into the body of Christ by the priest in an act that we call the consecration of the host. The priest has the power to transform the bread into the body of Christ and the wine into the blood of Christ. This is called the doctrine of transubstantiation. It was um, developed in the history of doctrine primarily by Thomas Aquinas who was born in 1225 and died in 1274. Um, those of us who are more Protestant in our theology may have different views about exactly what happens there are some Protestants who believe that there is a real presence of Christ in the bread and in the wine, but it, that it's a spiritual presence, not a physical presence, like the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox say. There are others, mainly coming from the tradition of Zwingli, the Swiss reformer, and coming into, say, most of the Baptist churches that say that the Lord's Supper is really just a memorial of Christ's death. Christ said, this do in remembrance of me. And when the Catholics and the, and the Orthodox say, no, no, Christ said, this is my body. Well, Christ also said, I am the door. Does that mean that Christ is a door that hangs on hinges? Let me just say one thing. We don't really need to get off into the controversy about the Lord's Supper. But I will say this, since we are, are um, looking at the doctrine in, in Acts 2.42, I will say this much. If transubstantiation takes place, transubstantiation is the formal theological word which means the bread actually becomes the body of Christ. The wine actually becomes the blood of Christ. Actually, materially, it is transformed. It becomes a different kind of matter. It actually becomes Christ's body and blood. If that happens, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, they say, well, yes, it is a miracle. This is the miracle which takes place in the Mass. But let's think about that in a minute. The whole point of a miracle is evidence. And do you know, there is a miracle of transubstantiation in the Old Testament. The Nile River is turned into blood. But you know, there's evidence. The Nile River is no longer green or blue, it's red. It looks like blood. It feels like blood, it smells like blood, and fish die in the river because it is blood. There is a miracle of transubstantiation in the New Testament. 
the water is turned to wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, John chapter 2. There's evidence. People drink the wine and say, this is the best wine we've ever had. But during the Mass, there's no evidence. It remains bread and wine on the plate and in the cup. It remains bread and wine in the hand of the priest. It remains bread and wine in the mouth of the communicant. It remains bread and wine in the digestive tract of the person who takes the bread and the cup. There's no evidence at all. If it's a miracle, where is the evidence of the miracle? We do believe in miracles. And one reason we believe in miracles is because we have evidence for miracles. Whereas the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church simply say, oh, trust me, trust me, it's, it's really happening, it's really happening. And the way Aquinas explained it, I won't go too far into this, Aquinas explained it based on an analysis of matter provided by Aristotle. No one believes that anymore. No one. No one looks to Aristotle to understand what matter is like. Aquinas explained how transubstantiation really took place in the Mass by adopting Aristotle's view of matter. So I'm just saying that the Lord's Supper is very important, but Christians fight over what the Lord's Supper means. You don't have to have a clear theological understanding to be obedient. You can take the Lord's Supper without resolving all the ancient controversies of the church, even without resolving the Roman Catholic Orthodox Protestant controversies. And then the longer you're obedient and the more you study the Bible, the more the controversies will be resolved. Um, to take communion with someone, to take the Lord's Supper with someone, ought to mean that we are at peace with someone. One of the things we do before we take communion is we clear our conscience and we make sure that we have no known unconfessed sin. And if that sin has to do with a problem with another believer, we need to get it straight, especially if it's another believer in the room, in the service, who is also taking the bread and the cup. I don't know how often your local churches take communion. Um, some churches take communion only four times a year. Some churches take communion every time they meet. Some churches take communion once a month. But it's something very, very important. And just like baptism, we were talking about baptism yesterday. We don't know all the reasons why it's important, but it is important. Baptism is a picture of something that happens once. It's a picture of our salvation. The death to our old life, the cleansing of our sin through forgiveness in Christ, and the reception of a new life, a resurrection life, through the new birth. So we die to the old life, we have our sins washed away, we are raised to walk in newness of life. That only happens once. That happens when we get saved. So how many times are we baptized? We're baptized once to show how we receive life. But how do we sustain life? Well, we sustain life by eating and drinking. This is something that goes on and on and on and on. So we receive life through the death and resurrection of Christ but we feed on Christ, on the resurrected Christ, who is our life. Christ now is our life. And since we continue to live over and over and over every day, we live, we take communion over and over and over. Baptism is a picture of something spiritually which happens once. The Lord's Supper is a picture of something spiritually which continues, which happens over and over and over and over. Probably, the early church took communion every time they met and probably it was around a meal, a full meal. Again, there are churches who try to do it just like the early church. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It becomes wrong when you look at other churches and say, we're like the early church. You're not like the early church. We're right. You're wrong. That's when it becomes a problem. Okay. So Acts 2.42 talks about studying the Word, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Um, Prayer is something all Christians know about, all Christians talk about, all Christians agree is important. Maybe all Christians agree is the most important thing. But the reality is we don't pray very much. And we don't pray very fervently. We don't pray very emotionally. And we don't pray very long. I was preaching in North Carolina once about 25 years ago, over 25 years ago. And I said, the reason we don't have revival is because no one's really praying for revival. And after the sermon, a very proud lady, very proud, a lady who thought a lot of her spirituality, she came up to me and she said, what do you mean no one is praying for revival? I'm praying for revival. And I said, well, what I mean is this. The last great revival we had in the West took place in Wales, 1904-1905. In 1893, a man called Evan Roberts began to pray for Wales. He prayed four hours a day for 11 years. After praying for four hours a day for 11 years, revival came. I said, that's what I mean by praying for revival. She said, oh, we think we pray, but we really don't pray. John Wesley said, I don't think of very much of a man who doesn't pray for four hours a day. Well, I don't think John Wesley would have thought very much of me. Martin Luther said, I have so much to do today. I have so much work to do today. I'll probably have to spend half the day praying. Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not prepare us for the great work. Prayer does not prepare us for the great work. Prayer is the great work. And the early church prayed. They came together. They listened to the teaching of the apostles. They had fellowship each with the other. They took the Lord's Supper and they prayed. What we have at the end of Acts 2 is the picture of a kind of golden age, an age when things were wonderful in the church. Now, what follows um, is, import is very important to understand. Verse 43 says, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. So, miracles were happening. There's no doubt about it. But at this stage, at least, they were happening through the apostles, those who had been authorized by Jesus to teach the true doctrine with Jesus' own authority. All those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Karl Marx had a motto, a slogan. From each according to his means. To each according to his needs. In other words, people would give according to what they had. People would receive according to what they didn't have. He got that from the Bible. Now, in the history of the world and in the history of Christianity, many people have tried to justify socialism or communism with the Bible. And they point to a passage like this, 
And they may say at a maximum that no one should own personal property or private property, but the community should own all the property together. That's communism. Or they might say we as Christians should not own private property, but we should own the property communally with the other believers, the other members of our church. Well, so we ask the question, can you prove from the Bible that we all ought to be communists? Well, let me just say that the answer is no. Um, what's the difference? Well, the difference is this. Communism is a lovely thing, a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing, as long as it's voluntary, as long as it's based on love. The family is a communist unit. The family share everything together. They share the house. They share the food. The mother and father usually provide the clothes and, and, and the family enjoys everything together. That's beautiful, that's wonderful. That's based on love. But when the government comes along and points a gun at the peasant and says, you've got to give up your cow because now the community's gonna own the cow and the commissars decide who owns what, and you're not doing it because you want to do it, you're not doing it because you love, you're doing it because somebody's pointing a gun at you, you're doing it because you're going to be dragged off to prison if you don't do it. That's not a beautiful thing. That's an ugly thing. That's a terrible thing. And so we need to be careful how we use the Bible. Now, as far as we know, the Jerusalem church was the only church who had all the property in common. Now here is an example of what I was telling you at the beginning. Nowhere is it commanded that we are to give up our property to the other church members. There is a place where Jesus told somebody to sell what he had and give to the poor. That was the rich young ruler. We can talk about that in a minute. But no place is it commanded that if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to go to church, you need to share your property. So it's not a command, it's a pattern. It's a pattern in the book of Acts. It's a pattern in the church in Jerusalem. We don't see the pattern in, in, in any other church. So do we have to do it? Are we commanded to do it? No. Now, having said that, I don't know if you can understand it, this in English. Live lightly to material things. Live lightly to material things. Be willing to give material things up. Be sure that you own material things. Don't let those material things own you. When I say live lightly to material things, this is a material thing. This is a watch. It's a very cheap watch. I bought it last summer on an airplane because I lost my other watch last summer. That's a material thing. Don't hold material things like this, okay? Don't, don't hold material things like this. Hold material things like th this. Yes, that's my watch. You have watches. You have material things. Hold those material things like that. Hold them up to God. And if God takes them away, don't be sad. You know, because if God takes something out of your hand, he'll put his hand in your hand. God won't leave you empty-handed because he always offers his hand. This is the way the Jerusalem church lived. It's a beautiful way to live. Is government-enforced communism good? No, it's terrible. Terrible. You know that much better than I do. Is the family good? The family is wonderful. Is the family communistic? Yeah, it is. Is the family kind of like the church in Jerusalem? Yeah, it is. Was the church in Jerusalem kind of like a family? Yes, it was. It's beautiful. It's beautiful when you do it because of love, because you want to. It's ugly when the government makes you do it. That's awful. So let's understand what these things mean and, and, and what these things don't mean. Look at verse 46. This is why I call it a golden age. Day by day, 
continuing with one mind in the temple. You see, they're not only in, in houses, but they also go to the temple. In the temple and from house to house. It's not either or. It's not only in the house. It's not only in the temple. It's both. We also see this in Acts chapter 20 when Paul talks about what he did in Ephesus. So um, they meet everywhere. They meet all the time. They worship everywhere. They worship all the time. They were taking their meals together. They were eating together. And they were glad. They were happy. And they were sincere in their worship and sincere in their sharing. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And it says, this is the last verse in the book of, in, in Acts chapter 2, this great uh, chapter on Pentecost. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. God is causing the increase. God is bringing people to Himself. God is bringing people to His Son. You see why I call it a golden age? Every society, every community, every nation has the memory of a golden age. In Athens, it was the age of Pericles. In Rome, it was the age of Augustus. Someone said that Caesar Augustus found Rome granite and he left it marble. It was a golden age, the age of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. There was peace because the Romans conquered everybody. There wasn't anybody else who could fight them. And so this was a golden age in the history of Rome. Uh, Russia has the memory of a golden age. I think after communism, maybe some of your orthodox leaders convinced you that before World War I, before the revolution, there was a golden age of Russia where everything was wonderful and that the orthodox church could lead you back to that golden age and that's the way you discover your identity. I think probably that view of history was a little bit exaggerated and a little bit romantic. I'm not sure that was really true. But most societies think that way. America thinks that way about times in their past. Usually it's not so accurate. Usually it's a little bit exaggerated and romanticized. But the fact is, this really was a golden age in the history of the church. It didn't last for very long. There are storm clouds on the horizon. Persecution is going to come. Bad persecution. Persecution which meant imprisonment, persecution which meant death. It's going to come soon. But right now, everything is wonderful and the church is meeting together and enjoying one another. And people are becoming Christians. It's amazing to think that someone would not become a Christian while Jesus was alive and preaching, but who later would become Christians because of the preaching of the church. That just shows what the Holy Spirit can do that the Holy Spirit can reproduce the power of Christ and the conviction of sin and the desire to be saved and to receive the free gift of grace which Jesus offers. Even though our God is invisible, we can't see Him. He's in heaven. But we can see His works. We can see what He does. We can see what He does in the lives of believers. We come to the end of Acts 2, which is probably the most important chapter in the book of Acts. We've been looking at the church's golden age in the last few verses of the chapter. But before we leave it behind, I think I do want to say something else about this business of Christians owning everything in common, giving up their possessions for the possession of the church, the possession of the community. Um, let's look at that a little more deeply because it is something that concerns us. There's a famous encounter that Jesus has, an interview with a young man in Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19, beginning in verse 16. We call this in America, in, in English, we call this the story of the rich young ruler. And he's a young man who, who comes to Jesus and he says, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? That's Matthew 19, 16. What do I have to do to be sure I'm going to heaven? Now, immediately we learn two things about this young man. First of all, what he's really interested in is the reward. 
What he's really interested in is the product, not the process. He's not really interested in God. He's interested in what God can give him. That's the first thing. The second thing is that he proposes a system of salvation by works. What do I have to do to gain my own salvation? These are the terms that the young man lays down to the Lord Jesus. Now, maybe we want Jesus to give him a theological formula. Maybe we want Jesus to say something very simple, very short, very crisp, to assure him you can only be saved by grace, you can only receive salvation as a free gift, there's nothing you can do. Maybe we want Jesus to talk like that to him, but he doesn't. He doesn't talk like that to him. He plays the game. Jesus plays the game that the young man wants to play. He plays the game of salvation by works. So Jesus says, oh, so you want to know what you can do so you can have eternal life. He said, well, I'll I'll tell you um, what you can do. Keep the commandments. Well, Now, how many commandments are there? Are there 10 commandments? No, they're not just 10 commandments. When we study the Old Testament carefully, we discover that there are 613 commandments. So Jesus says, well, you want to go to heaven? You want eternal life? Keep the commandments. The young man says, which ones? You see what he's doing. He wants to know what is the least amount that I can give to get everything. Surely I don't have to keep all the commandments to receive heaven for all eternity. So what what is the least I can do to get the greatest reward? That's the way he wants to work it out. So Jesus says, well, um, you shall not commit murder. That's the sixth commandment. Okay, he, he starts to share the Ten Commandments with him. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, which is the ninth commandment. You shall, not on, you shall honor your father and your mother. And then he says... Then he shares something that is not one of the Ten Commandments, but it is one of the commandments. We find the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. So Jesus gives commands from from those lists, but then he shares a commandment that is not from either one of those chapters. Then he shares the command that we find in Leviticus 19.18, which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Which on another occasion, Jesus says, is the second commandment just as important as the first commandment, to love the Lord your God. Well, the young man says, oh, I've always done that. I've always done those things. Of course, he had not done those things. As a matter of fact, when he said that, he broke the ninth commandment because he was bearing false witness. He was lying. He said, I've always done those things. That's a lie. That's the ninth commandment says, don't lie. Don't bear false witness. Jesus listed the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness. So how does he respond to that? He bears false witness. He says, oh yes, I've always done those things. I think another gospel writer tells us, Luke maybe, that he says, I've done those things since I was a child. Child's play. Keeping the commandments is child's play. A child could keep the commandments. No problem at all. No problem. Jesus says, okay, fine. There's just one more little thing you've got to do. Just one more little thing. If you've done all those things, this won't be any problem at all for you. Sell your possessions. Give the money to the poor then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. 
It says in Matthew 19, 22, when the young man heard this statement, he became very sad and he went away because he was rich. He would have to give away a lot to do that. Now, what does it mean? First of all, the young man said he had kept the commandment to love his neighbor as he loved himself. That's a lie. What Jesus said was, oh, you love your neighbor as much as yourself? Well, if you love your neighbor as much as yourself, then it doesn't matter who has your money, does it? It's a matter of complete indifference to you. It doesn't matter whether you have your money or your neighbor has your money because you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So if you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, just give your neighbor everything you have. It's the same thing. If you have it, if your neighbor has it, it doesn't make any difference because you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. There, no problem. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. But I want to tell you something. So he's teaching... He's teaching him a great lesson. But I want to tell you something. When we read this passage, we really view it as some great requirement that Jesus made of someone else, that he gives something up. I don't read it that way. I read it as just the opposite. I don't think it was a great requirement to give up something, I think it was a great offer to receive something because here's what Jesus said. He said, and then come and follow me. You know what Jesus was saying? I'll take care of all your needs. Now here's the question. Who do you want to pay your bills? Do you want to pay your bills? Or do you want Jesus to pay your bills? Who do you want to give you a house? Do you want to get a house on your own? Or do you want Jesus to get you a house? Who do you want to take care of your, your health? Do you want to take care of your health with your money? Or do you want Jesus to take care of your health? You see what he's saying? Come and follow me. I'll take care of all that. Basically what he was saying is if you want to have eternal life, trust me. Have faith in me to provide everything for you. He really is giving him a grace answer. He's not giving him a works answer. It sounds like a work ans works answer, but it's really not a works answer. He's saying, trust me. Now, does Jesus say this to all of us? Well, he does say, trust me to all of us. And I don't want to make it too easy for you. I don't want to come to Acts 2 and say, yes, the first century church, the church at Jerusalem, they had all their property in common, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I don't want to come to Matthew 19 and say, yes, Christ did tell the rich young ruler to sell everything and give the money to the poor, but you don't have to do that. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about Matthew 19. Don't worry about Acts 2. I don't want to say that to you. I'm not here to make it easy for you. Remember what I said. The Christian life is not hard. The Christian life is impossible. Only one person has ever lived the Christian life. That person is Jesus of Nazareth. Only one person can ever live the Christian life again. That person is Jesus of Nazareth living inside you, Christ living His life through you. That's the only way you or I will ever live the Christian life. That's the only way you or I will even keep, ever keep one commandment, much less all the commandments. So, what am I saying practically? What is the conclusion? What do we have to give up? What do we have to give away to be a Christian? Only one thing. Only one thing. 
the thing you're not willing to give up. Whatever that is, that's what you've got to give up if you're going to follow Christ. Am I saying you've got to give that up to be saved? No. You, you don't get saved by what you give up. You get saved by what Christ gives up. You, get, you don't get saved by what you give to Christ. You get saved by what you receive from Christ. But if you want to follow Him, if you want to live the Christian life, then you need to be willing to give up everything. But really, the only thing you need to give up are those things you're not willing to give up. Because if you're willing to give them up, they're, they're not a problem. Now, you work this out on your own. I can't solve it for you. You work this out alone with the Lord. It may be a career. It may be a man, a relationship. It may be a thing, it may be a possession. Whatever comes between you and Christ is an idol. So we give it up. This young man had an idol. His idol was his property, his wealth, his estate. But it's a deep, deep story. It's a deep, deep reality. It's not what it seems on the surface. So stay in it. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.